record on this computer. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Liz Rainey. Um, and yes, this is a preview and a run through of the making of and the themes that are featured in Julie Dash's 1991 film Daughters of the Dust. And this film has a um, special significance to me because I'm from the area um, of the people that are the characters in the story. And so a lot of the scenes and themes and people that are in this film, um, I was able to connect to my own life. And so there's this um, personal entanglement really with the film. And I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Okay. Um, so can everyone uh, see that intro slide? Awesome. Um, yes, so Daughters, uh, Daughters of the Dust is a film made by Julie Dash, um, who is a director. She is part of what the movement known as the LA Rebellion, which I'll describe a little in a little more detail later. Um, it came out in 1991, and it was the first film by a uh, female African-American director to have a wide release. It is set on the Sea Islands um, off the coast of South Carolina and of, Ge and of Georgia, um, and it follows a family that is on the precipice of a big change. So the, the film is set in 1902 and slavery has been banned or abolished for not that long. And you have Nana Pizant, who is this character in a kind of blue indigo dress. And she is the matriarch of the family She's the holder of the family history, of the family traditions, and everyone looks to her really as the leader. But she is also the symbol of the past. So she was born um, into slavery, and she is the symbol of holding on to the traditions. And the younger members of the family, so for instance, um, her children, her great-grandchildren, they are all trying to pursue those opportunities that are coming in the early of 20, 20th century. So that access to travel, that access to education. And so there's a, there's a, a tension throughout the film of do they stay on the island and stay connected to those traditions that have survived the transatlantic Atlantic slave trade, those traditions that go back um, to their ancestors from various parts of Africa, or do they take that chance of going to the mainland, um, but possibly losing their connection to that past. And it's a, it's a binary or a dilemma that is um, very real and that affects um, a lot of people in the area. Um, and one of the main themes I think that is in this movie is that you can't know where you're going without knowing where you're from and who made you. Um, and 
for, I know for myself, and I think for a lot of people of African descent, there's this process of relearning those ties. Um, and a lot of, because a lot of times those links to the past and those links to ancestors have often been traditional, um, intentionally hidden from us or erased because there is this power um, in knowing where you come from and of knowing um, who are those people that came before you. And, and so I think this film, it's, it's speaking to that larger tradition of relearning um, where we're from and who, we, and who we come from. And I wanted to start with this particular scene because when I first watched this, um, I first came in contact, in contact with Julie Dash's film. And one of my final classes um, in my undergraduate semester in Savannah. And when I saw this scene, it, it really struck me because it was a scene I knew so well. Um, you know, this is the, the grandmother figure and then um, Barbara O's character, Yel Yellow Mary, kneeling at the grandmother figure, kneeling at that, that family knowledge. Um, it's a scene that I had done so many times in my life. And this was one of the first instances, this film, where I saw my family um, and the people that I knew reflected back to me on screen. Um, and there's such power in that. I, I, I like to use the, the quote from the writer uh, Fatima Bhutto when she says, pop culture is an innocent um, and it's not just entertainment, it's cultural messaging. And so when we see ourselves reflected and we see our families reflected like this back to us, um, you know, it's a reminder that our families, our grandmothers, they are all cultural producers. They have all done this cultural work um, that has contributed to the fabric of, of who we are as a society. Um, and yeah, I, it's, it's really powerful to see that um, reflected back. In this character in, in particular, as I was saying, Nana Pazant, she reminded me so much of my grandmother, um, in particular in the way that the family would rally around her. So these are the, the children and the grandchildren that are listening to her because she is the only link really um, to those older family members and to those ancestors. And so the, to give a setting of where this is taking place, uh, the Gullah Geechee community is along the coast um, of North, Southern North Carolina, South Carolina, um, Georgia, and a, a bit of Florida. And so there are several islands, for instance, there's Sapelo, there's the Fusky around Georgia that fall into the um, Gullah Geechee Corridor. And typically the area around South Carolina is referred more to as Gullah. And then once you come into Georgia, it's referred more to as Geechee. Um, and my hometown actually is Savannah, um, right here, Chatham County on the, on the coast of Georgia. So I was um, raised and brought up uh, really in the, in the depths of the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Um, and I was actually talking to my, my cousin last night and she was describing how the family would go out to the Fusky on Sundays and spend their afternoons there. Um, so it's, it's many generations of connection with this. Um, and this is the trailer, the restored trailer 
for Daughters of the Dust, which I'll share, turn on here. Um, can anybody hear that? What they got out there anyway, Ola? Life, child, the beginning of a new life. Just because we cross over to the mainland, it doesn't mean we don't love you. I you can leave this soil. This soil. Because we from the sea. We came here in chains. When they go down in the water, they ain't never come up. And nobody can walk on water. I need to know that I can come and hold on to what I come from. A pass on us. You think you can cross over to the mainland and run away from it? Never forget who we is and how far we done come. So there are so many uh, layers to, um, to the film. There's the history that's mixed into the film. And there's also how um, the cinematography of it and the way that the land itself is portrayed. It's so beautifully filmed and so beautifully crafted, um, which all feeds into um, the story and the setting and the people that Julie Dash is representing. Um, and, and I just wanted to uh, briefly touch on this photograph. This is actually a photograph that I took um, many years ago. And so on the right here, uh, this is actually my grandmother. And on the left, is a, um, a chief of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. And I believe his name was Chief Little Feather. Um, it's been a few years. But what happened was I um, had an assignment. I was in film photography and I had to um, shoot rolls of, rolls of 35 millimeter film. And I happened to hear that the uh, Easter band of, as part of the Easter band of Cherokee were coming to the flea market to do a performance. And um, so I went and I brought my grandmother and something remarkable happened. So they, they started talking and they realized that they were from the exact, their families were from the exact same town. Um, they were from Levi, South Carolina. And as soon as they they realized that, they, I mean, it was like they knew each other. They were talking about everything, about the past, about the old folks, about the traditions, about the town. Um, and at the time, I couldn't fully understand what was going on. I mean, I was I didn't know we were from Levi, South Carolina. Like I didn't I didn't know um, so much of that past. But looking back on that photograph, um, there's so much knowledge between the two of them. There's so much wisdom. Um, and I had so, so many questions after that. You know, I, after taking this photo, I thought about it and I said, well, what is that relationship between um, indigenous people and people of African descent in this area? Because we talk, you know, in school, I had learned a lot about the relationship between people of African descent and white people, indigenous people and white people. But this particular relationship, um, I, I was never talked about. 
And that relationship is briefly touched on in Daughters of the Dust. Um, but there's, there's a quote from Daughters of the Dust where Nana Pazant says, um, the ancestors show, show up when we least expect them. And, you know, this, I think this picture just reminds me of um, that they do, they really do. They, they show up when we least, when we're least ready, um, but they show up to hold that, that link, even though that link has, people have tried to um, destroy that link. That link is too strong to be destroyed. Um, so to go into the, to kind of jump gears and go into the setting that um, Julie Dash is learning and making out of. She was part of a group of students at UCLA known as the LA Rebellion. And so what happened was there was a ethno communications initiative in UCLA's film department. And it was aimed at BIPOC people um, both from the US and from other countries. And so the LA Rebellion in particular is a group of, stu of former students, um, now directors who are of African heritage. And so it includes African Americans as well as um, for, uh, students and people that were from various countries in Africa. And the list of filmmakers is so deep and, and so wide. So it includes Julie Dash, um, Gay Edbel, Abel Bay, um, Larry Clark, Monona Wally, um, Shuri Kiana Aina, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Frazier, in addition to many others. And they recently, UCLA recently released a anthology um, which for educators is free of cost. And I think it's, it's um, low cost for non-educators. But if you wanna find out more about that, uh, if you visit cinema.ucla.edu and uh, just search the LA Rebellion, there's tons of information on lots of their work, their uh, filmography and the initiative itself. And so Julie Dash was born in Long Island, New York. And um, as I said earlier, part of the LA Rebellion. She is a writer, director, and producer. And she's credited with all three on Daughters of the Dust. Um, her other films include Travel, Notes on a Geechee Girl, and the Rosa Parks story. She recently, maybe a couple of years ago, was made an Academy member. Um, and the wild thing is this happened 26 years after she um, initially had applied. And when I was I actually wrote a long uh, essay on Daughters of the Dust and Julie Dash um, back in that class that I took in undergraduate and for, totally forgot that I had written it. But as I was doing the research, um, I was reading about how she developed the story and the reception. Um, and so the reception when Daughters of the Dust first came out um, is so wildly different from where it is, the, the understanding of it now. Um, and of course the film has um, inspired many people, including if you look at the imagery in Beyonce's Lemonade, which I'll show a little bit of later, um, those images, that dress, uh, that visual language is hearkening back to this film. But when she first released it, 
um, the critics um, and even some of the audience members, they were very, um, they're very harsh. Uh, even some reviews saying that Julie Dash didn't have a future in film. Um, and this, this quote is where she's talking about how when it was first released, uh, she says some people, they, they just went flying out of the audience. Um, she would actually see men run out of the, run out of the theater. And the, the earlier part of that quote, uh, she breaks down this idea that when we, when we see characters in film, we are um, putting on that perspective where we're putting on that, that way of seeing, um, because back to the, the Fatima Bhutto quote, pop culture is cultural messaging. And so there were moments where um, there, were, um, there were men or th there were white men or black men um, or in some instances, white women who couldn't put on or couldn't look through that view um, of the black women that Julie Dash was portraying. And she said, um, definitively, she said, every creative decision I made that she made for the movie was in service to the women she was portraying. So how the story unfolds, um, it's very circular. And that was intentional. That was to reflect how um, stories unfold among families, among um, African-American women in the family, among African griots, um, the color choices. So from that um, picture I showed earlier where, you know, a lot of them are wearing these bright white clothes um, and the colors in that film, there's, there's yellows and purples and these, these rich colors. Um, all of those creative decisions were in service to the people that the black women that she was talking about. And so this film is very much seeing the world and seeing that particular landscape of the sea islands through their perspective. Um, and when it was first released, there were, there were a lot of people who could, who can do that. Um, and so that's, that's another thing. That's another point that, that makes Daughters of the Dust, um, for me so special is, is that not only is it a representation of where I'm from, but it's a representation of where I'm from through the eyes of the people I know and of the women specifically um, that raised me. And so talking specifically about the film, um, it was the, the first film uh, by an African-American woman to receive a, a, a wide theatrical release. Um, it's characterized in the genre called mytho documentary. Um, and what that is essentially is it gives you historical facts like a documentary would, but unlike the traditional documentary um, and unlike more, um, for lack of a better term, academic looks at culture, um, like through sociology or anthropology, these facts are wrapped up in storytelling and in myth. Um, and I'll, I'll go into some of the, the myths and history that, that is being referenced in the film. Um, but the idea of the mytho documentary is that it is functioning the way that family stories would function. So, you know, if 
when families are talking about relatives or traditions that pass down through the generations, it's often packaged in a story about um, the person. So, for instance, with me, um, my grandmother would tell me about the relatives um, that had passed on before, before I was born, in the forms of stories about them, to really kind of make them become concrete and become alive. And so that's the tactic of the mytho documentary. It is blurring that line between fact and fiction to give us this rounded and this complex view um, of a culture or of a setting. And um, as I said earlier, every creative decision that she made, it tied back to the culture. And you can see those colors uh, coming out in the, in the poster for Daughters of the Dust. And that, um, that quote that I mentioned earlier from, from Nana Pazant, um, where she says, we carry these memories inside of we, you know, ancestors come to you when you least expect them. Um, and, I, and I have to say that that moment, that picture with, um, with my grandmother and, and the chief, um, I took that earlier in the year. And then later in the year, um, my grandmother actually passed away. And I consider you know, myself very fortunate to um, have been able to grow up with that history right there in the house um, and to really be able to have those links and those ties to draw on. And um, so da Daughters of the Dust is, is filled with so much history um, and so many themes, but um, I wanted to touch on a few of the um, most prominent. And um, one of the first connections that um, you, you see in Daughters of the Dust is with Ebo Landing. So the, the story of, of Ebo Landing is it was a specific spot. Um, and so after slavery had been officially abolished, there was a ship called the Wanderer. And it was transporting several dozen slaves to um, Savannah, Georgia, uh, where it's my hometown. And the, so the, the ship was coming to Savannah and then the plan was that the, um, the, the buyers were going to transport the slaves to St. Simon's Island, which is not far, um, just a, 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 a few miles away. Uh, to be sold. And so um, there's the official story, there, there's the historical and the myth wrapped up in this. And so the, historic, the historical story is that um, the slaves, when they reached St. Simon's, the spot that, on, in the spot that is now Ebo Landing, they led a revolt against their masters. Um, and they actually killed all of their, um, all of their captors. And um, the, the historical account says that um, those slaves actually um, may have died in, in the water. Um, so it, it's this um, mass, massive loss of life in that area. Um, 
and to the other side of that, there, there is the, the mythical telling of the story um, among uh, many of the, the people of African descent in the area where the slaves actually, there are two versions, in one, they flew. So in one story, the slaves actually flew back home. Um, once they were fleed, they, they flew and returned home. And in, the, and in another telling, they actually turned around and they walked on the water as if it were solid ground. And they just walked, they walked back home. Um, they, they walked back to where they were from. Um, and you see both the, the, the myth and the history um, mentioned in Daughters of the Dust and in this kind of, um, in the myth, there's this, this striking imagery um, of people um, actually walking back to freedom, um, walking back to where they're from. And you also see one of the, one of the characters, Bilal Muhammad, he tells the historical version of it. Um, and there's a particular still, which you'll see in the film where it's the, the carved statue that is kind of floating, um, floating in the water and, and almost ties to, um, ties to the story of, of the choices that the family has to make. You know, they, they go by boat um, to the mainland. So there, there also is this running theme of what, um, what the water means and what the, and what the water can bring um, and how, um, how Africans and people of African descent, um, that relationship to the water and to the land. Um, and speaking about Bilal Muhammad, he, his story in the film is that he was actually taken from the West Indies and he is Muslim and you see him uh, holding on to the Muslim traditions, um, praying, reading from the Quran, and it, it ties into the, um, the complexity of religion because you, you're, seeing, you're seeing Islam play out in the movie, you're seeing Christianity in that one of the, the daughters um, one of the most fervent believers of moving inland um, is a devout Christian and kind of looks down both on uh, Bilal and on um, Nana Fazat, who is a tie to the more um, traditional um, African forms of religion that that granddaughter looks down on both of them as kind of being backward um, or or being um, of the past and a few times um, she, she actually mentions to Nana Pazant that um, she's using a, a type of they they say hoodoo or or voodoo um, but the way that religion is per portrayed in this film is really reflecting the, the complexity of religion um, in communities of people of African descent. Um, because if I remember right, um, currently most people of African descent in the world um, are actually Muslim. And there is this heritage of um, the Muslim religion and factoring into the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X and civil rights movements. Of course, there's also that history of um, the work of people like 
Dr. King and the use of Christianity and of spirituals and of gospel in the civil rights religion. Um, and also that awareness of connections to ties um, and traditions such as the Orishas that you see um, throughout not only North America, but also throughout the Caribbean and throughout Latin America. So it's this very, um, it's this complex view of, of religion. And also this um, complex view of that indigenous and African relationship. Um, so like I said earlier, that was something that I wasn't, didn't remember hearing talked about in school but that photograph was starting to um, lead me to ask questions. And you see a moment in the, in the film where one of the granddaughters um, ends up having this relationship with a, a member of the, of the Cherokee Nation. And that relationship, the more that I've looked into it, the more I understand that it is equally as complex um, and as layered um, as that, that understanding of religion. And in fact, a, a, good, um, a good book, if you're interested in that, the author T.O. Miles has the, the Ties That Bind, which through, again, using, using stories, um, through the story of a particular Afro-Cherokee family, talks about um, the, how that, how those relationships change and evolve and have evolved over time. Um, and there's also in the film, the, the story of tradition and, and I say advancement, but really it's, it's a different, um, it's a different way of being. And, and that's the, the, this, this really the central conflict of the story is how do you find that balance? And the, the film shows one particular family's process and it doesn't um, necessarily make a judgment on the right way or the wrong way to do that, but it's, it's showing how they're working through it. Um, and like I said, that's a, that's a tough decision for um, a lot of people still, still on these islands. Um, before before I, I, I left Savannah um, for the same class, we, we went to Sapelo Island um, and we were there while the writer Cornelia Bailey was still alive. Um, and she wrote the book, God, Dr. Buzzard, and the Belita Man. And at the time, you know, she was talking about how there is this um, struggle because you have wealthier people, often from very nowhere near the area, that are buying up the land and offering these prices. And people have, you know, they have the opportunity to kind of take that money, move inland, and perhaps pay for education for their kids. And at the same time, there is this um, collective loss of the tradition and of the land. Um, and St. Simon's, so that I mentioned earlier, in Hilton Head, islands like that that are now known for being resorts, and for hotels and for golf courses, that was all traditional Gullah Geechee indigenous land um, that was slowly bought up and turned into something else. Um, so the, the struggle or the, the, um, the paradox is still very much happening right now in the area. Um, and finally, the, the, one of the really, really special things about the film is the way that we see um, Black womanhood. It is so dimensional. 
um, you have, you know, you have your Nana Pazan character, the matriarch, you have some of her children um, that are leaning more toward, um, more toward going inland. You have um, the youth. And so you have one character who is um, not born quite yet, but a lot of the story is told from her perspective. Um, and she is going to be um, that new generation, that generation that is um, born after the ending of slavery and really with this completely different landscape. And you also have Yellow Mary who was featured in that, um, that very first still who she has been living um, all around the culture, all around the country. She's of lighter skin, um, which is where, which is part of the reason why they, um, why they call her Yellow Mary. Um, and a lot of, some of the, the relatives look down on her because of her past. But there's this this moment where Eula, the the granddaughter, is really saying, "But she's she's a part of us. She's family, and so she's our she's our blood. She's our body. She's she's we're a part of her, and she is a part of us." Um, and there's also the relationship that isn't talked about much um, in the film, but. Um, uh, Yellow Mary brings this woman with her to visit, um, which could could be her partner. So there's this reflection of um, different forms of black um, womanhood, of black femininity, of black strength, of black vulnerability, um, of black queerness, of all of these layers that that go into um, these women being who they are. And so just to, um, to round it out, I mean, when I, I was making my work, um, my thesis work, and in this video, I was talking about um, being from Savannah, being from home and the ancestors. And I mean, it's not, uh, I don't really, I'm not hiding it, like you can see, um, the color scheme, um, the, the framing is all influenced by Julie Dash. Um, I filmed this in the exact same ratio, so it's not, it's not like 35 millimeter film or it's not a film reel, but I, I realized Julie Dash is film is in a specific ratio or format. And so I, I made my project in that exact format, um, connected back to Daughters of the Dust. And just to round it out, so this is a scene um, with the uh, Yellow Mary, Eula, um, and the, the woman that has traveled with her in the trees, trees that you know I know well um, have, have played played on all my life. And this is a scene from uh, Beyonce's uh, ooh, Lemonade or Up All Night, um, a, a scene from her visual album where you can see um, that visual language, right, happening, sitting, sitting in the tree, um, high up in those roots. Uh, and then that's me on Sapelo. Um, <laughs> And, you know, again, it's, it's this, um, this beauty where it's like, you know, it's not staged, it's not choreographed, it's, it's, just, it's just life. Um, and yeah, I think that's, you know, that's why this film um, means quite so much to me is I think when all of us see ourselves reflected we understand our role as cultural makers um, and we understand our, um, we, we get to know who we are. 
um, and that no matter what, those links to the past um, will remain with us. And um, I think I'm going to stop sharing now. <laughs> Liz, this is so amazing. Um, absolutely incredible. I feel like I learned so much from you that I didn't know. And so I'm so, so excited. Um, would this be the opportunity for people to ask questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Liz, I don't think we've had a chance to meet. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Sue Nutty. I've taught art history at Mecca for many years. Um, Liz, thank you so much for bringing this film to Mecca for this week. It's such a beautiful film and so important. Um, I just wanted to share with you um, a little bit of my story of uh, a connection to this film. Um, uh, I go back further than most of you on the call, I imagine. And in the 1990s, I taught at uh, Earlham College in Indiana, which is a Quaker college. And every year started with a required faculty retreat so that the entire faculty had some kind of shared community experience that, that we would then sh uh, share with the entire college for the rest of the year. And one year it was centered around this film. So that's my memory of this film. I mean, it, I think it kind of changed my life. Um, it, we had such an interesting experience with it. I remember it so well from the 90s. Um, to tell you the kind of college this was, another year the film was Thelma and Louise. So that's, that's kind of where we were at at the time. Um, but the, the remarkable thing about this film is, as you said, the content, but also the physical beauty of it. It's the imagery that has stuck with me over all of these years. You could take any still from this film, and especially in an art school, and just analyze it from a formal standpoint, the, the, the composition, the color palette. As you said, the color palette tells a story all its own in a way that I, I can't think of a similar film that does that. Um, I think Julie Dash's story is, is worth thinking a lot about. You know, she's never had another major studio film in all this time. She's never had another studio give her the opportunity to make a feature le length film. Um, the other thing that I remember from the time that the film was criticized for, or maybe not criticized, maybe that's not the, the right word. One of the, the challenges of the film is that several of the, the characters speak in dialect throughout the whole film. It's very intentional on Julie Dash's part. And she means you to have to listen really carefully. She doesn't accommodate the audience, if you know what I mean. She means you to have to really pay attention. Um, and when you do, you'd understand perfectly what they're saying. But you, you, the, the viewer kind of has to do the work uh, to enter into this culture um, and to, 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 to listen carefully as well as look really carefully. Um, and I just wanted to, to call attention to anybody who wants to, to know a little bit more about Julie, Julie Dash. The National Gallery of Art um, just had her as guest lecturer in December and there's an over hour long lecture with her on the National Gallery of Art website which is really interesting. She talks a lot about her early photographic his career in New York before she got to LA. And then she talks in some length about this film and about writing the screenplay and all the challenges that she faced in the production of this movie. Um, and so that's easily accessible on the National Gallery of Art website. So I just wanted to share those things with you. Again, Liz, thank you so much for bringing this to the college. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the, um, the visual beauty that, that happens is, in this film is um, a big part because you have um, essentially um, a black woman saying, okay, how do, I, how do I truthfully represent or authentically represent um, the black woman that I'm talking about? 
Um, so, so there's this, um, which I've, I've wrote some about, about this particular um, way of seeing that is, is fashioned over generations. And that once you start tapping into that, um, there's this whole visual language and, and um, visual interpretation that really starts coming out. Um, and like I, like I said, you know, I didn't see this film until the last class in my last year of undergraduate. And that made me mad, honestly, because it was like, I had been raised in Savannah my whole life. We see Gone with the Wind every year. You know, we see these Shakespeare adaptations every year. How is it no one thought it was relevant to show this film to a group of kids who are from this culture? And I think that's, that's something that, um, that I've thought about is that, you know, students, students are often walking into class with histories that we don't know. Um, and so like me, right, walking into class with this, this history um, that I wasn't seeing talked about in my classes, um, you know, students are, are walking in with all kinds of um, histories that maybe we're partially familiar with and, and maybe we're not, and that there's this beauty when you can provide space for even if we don't know that history um, those histories to be shared and so the um, the professor that showed me this movie who actually like I'm now very good friends with um, you know by providing that space um, even though this wasn't necessarily her history she was from West Virginia um, but she she knew she recognized where she was and provided that space, um, and and that um, really made you know I'm I'm still talking about it right you know so imagine what happens when students have access to this you know when they're in elementary school and they get decades you know instead of a few years to live with it. Um, yeah. Liz, thank you for sharing that, that thought. I, I had that realization the first time I heard Seth Goldstein do the walking tour of Portland um, in his perspective on the Atlantic Black Box Project. Um, for those of you that don't know, Seth Goldstein is a local historian and faculty here at Mecca, and he's doing Resilience Week as well. And um, he gave, I think it was an hour or two long, uh, two hour presentation, literally walking through the streets of downtown Portland, where I was born and raised from <laughs> kindergarten to uh, 12th grade. Um, literally walking the streets that I grew up on and didn't know the history of my own town until this year. Um, and so I think, you know, this really hits to the point of Resilience Week is having these conversations and engaging in dialogue about um, diversity, about inclusion, but also about you know, giving voice to historically marginalized populations and just really lifting the veil that's been over our eyes and thinking critically about why did we not know that? Um, you know, you mentioned Gone with the Wind. I um, studied theater in college and joked, joked a lot about how um, most theaters and theater companies present the same plays over and over again. Like, I'm so sick of watching Guys and Dolls. And, you know, why can't we? <laughs> why? I'm going off on a little bit of tangent here. My boss is on this call. So I'll stop. But, um, 
you know, we just we need to diversify. Oh, it's all good. So you're you're going you're on the right you're on the right path. Don't stop. <laughs> Thank you. You're, 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 I filter myself. You can't get in trouble uh, speaking the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we need to diversify what we're showing people and what is being shown and um, you know, not just films but theater and books and um, there's so much, you know, so I, I, I love this too. And I didn't know um, anything about this film. I didn't know anything about um, Julie Dash. And and now I'm like, oh my goodness, there's references to Beyonce. Like, <laughs> oh, that's so cool. You know, and I love your thought about the pop culture. So I do, I really appreciate this conversation. And I'm glad we recorded it. And Liz, and I just having grown up in the South and know about knowing about Hilton Head and going there when I was a young kid, like a middle schooler, what is what is also very striking for people that don't know that part of the country is how um, how obliterated visually, depending on where you travel, this particular history is. It, even in the sense the way that these golf courses and resort towns have been created. So not only is this the, this history, some of which is recent, very recent, still about kind of. Um, finding ways to negotiate people out of their property, but how this history is just obliterated behind a scrim of, um, uh, of resort and vacation mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so uh, really, really powerful, Liz, and thank you for sharing. If you've been down to that part of the, I mean, it's a beautiful part of the world, but the, the contrast as Liz, I would say Liz, the contrasts that are uncovered are even visually more striking if you're there, say, in Savannah or at Hilton Head, right? I mean, the, the, con the contrast is so uh, total and complete that it's its its own type of shock. Right, yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's all over. I, um, it's so easy to go back to my grandma, but, you know, we would be driving down uh, one of the streets um, in Savannah, it's called Skidaway. And as we're driving, she would say to me, okay, you see how narrow the street is? And mm -hmm. you see how long it is? And you see how it goes from the river all the way back inland? Yeah, that's because this was a Yamacraw trail that they just paved over. And that, it, it was that like, it was every day, right? It, it was this, for me, it was this everyday little reminder that you're right, you can't see. Um, and that, you know, a lot of the other, a lot of my classmates weren't getting. Um, so yeah, yeah, it definitely is a process of um, not only relearning, relearning but reseeing as as well yeah thank you liz um i just popped in the chat that the film we're showing tonight at 6 p.m and someone had asked if there's another opportunity um liz because you work in the library do you know if um and you didn't mention you know you're an alum and <laughs> you're you're a faculty and like <laughs> all these things that yeah. you do at the college. <laughs> um, is there another opportunity? Um, can, do people have the ability to like check it out or? Um, I something? have to, um, I have to double check if we have Daughters of the Dust. It is available um, online. Um, and if I'm right, it's like, um, it's like two two dollars on YouTube or something like that, um, but uh, I will check and see if we have it in the library. And if not, I'm sure that it's something that we can get access to. Um, so if you just send us an email or if you stop by, we're happy to you know find a location that has it um, and get it for you. This is Shiva. Is it okay if I jump oh. in really quick? Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I just I echo what Liz said that um, we have a link that we can make available to students, staff, and faculty 
groups and for um, community members, we can try to um, figure something out. I, I love this film, so I want as many people to see it as possible. So if it's not too much trouble, if you could email library at mecca.edu and I'll put that in the chat and then um, we'll send you the information so that you can watch it. Thank you, Shiva. Well, people are starting to pop off. Um, so is there any other closing remarks that you'd like to make, Liz, before can I, we- Can I ask a quick question? Is that okay? <laughs> Sorry, I had like two, I had two really loud kiddos in the back, so. <sighs> so I'm really sorry if you covered this, Liz, but I'm just so curious. Um, I was thinking about it as you were presenting, um, and I know I talk to you all the time about archival silences, so I'm sorry that I'm always bringing it up. Um, but I, I've just been thinking so much lately about the way that um, artists work to fill these archival silences that um, historians and archivists don't. And I know that this film has not reached or has not gotten um, critical acclaim among filmmakers, but I just wonder among um, other historians in the area and um, other scholars, if it has gotten the um, credit that it that it deserves. Um, I think it is um, in recent years, I think it's really picked up. Um, if I'm right, fairly recently, it was added to the Library of Congress. Um, so it's, although I can't really, I haven't really done a lot of research in like history fields or um, sociology fields, but I, I know that in terms of art um, and in terms of, of culture, it's really starting to to pick up and so i took this class in 2016 um which feels so long ago uh but you know when i when i took it in 2016 my my professor had really structured the the entire class um on what she termed edge communities so it was the gala Geechee community in savannah um, it was the Dine community in um, Arizona. We actually went out to the Dine community um, in Tuba City and we read like Vine Deloria's Custer Died for Your Sins. Um, so I, I know that in that back then in that moment, there were people that were like trying to, to um, bring this type of work forward. And at the time, so at the time, my, te my professor um, could barely find this movie at all, right? It wasn't online, it, it, it wasn't um, widely, widely released. Um, but really in the past few years and with its emergence in pop culture and with the discussions that we're, that we're having now, it's been re-released, it's been restored um, and it's, um, it's been made much more accessible. And, and so I, that's a really interesting um, rabbit hole, I think, to go, to go down is that like, how would historians or um, you know, cult cultural um, studies people use this idea of the mytho documentary um, in, in this incorporation of myth and doing that kind of archival work um, I think it's a it's a genre that has a it's it's really just starting to be cracked and I think it could be really interesting. Yeah, and Liz and, and Shiva, that's why I, I brought up that the National Gallery of Art just showed this film in December and had Julie Dash as a as a guest lecturer and it's some kind of uh, endowed memorial lecture. So it's it's like one of their big deal lecture series. And my point is simply you don't get any more old school, mainstream, traditional art history than the National Gallery of Art. Um, and so it's, it's to me a pretty significant statement that they are bringing this, this film in effect into the fold as it were, you know, saying yes, this is legitimate. Um, you know, it took them a while to do that, but uh, I think it's important that they did so. 
Yeah, thank you both. It's always that tension is like the legitimizing is so problematic, but you know, it 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 also adds significance. So it's yeah, it, thank you both. That's really helpful. <laughs> Any other last questions? Hi. You're muted. Shahida. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. So I'm so grateful that both of you present are presenting this film. And as Liz knows, this is one of my all time top films. I saw it in the theaters when it first came out 30 years ago and had to drive like over an hour to see it because it wasn't showing where I was living. And we specifically went on the first night. So in case we loved it, we could drive down like another time to see it. And probably, it was probably right around this time last year that we hosted it at our home. And we had a dinner party with um, food from the Sea Islands and then um, watched it on the big screen. And it's one of those movies that, I think from the moment we, it could almost make me a little teary from the moment it started, the friends that I was with, we were like, this is such a significant film and just fell in love with it. And this year I was reading a list of top 10 films from a thousand uh, film people around the world. And knowing how little recognition Julie Dash got for this beautiful, piece of mytho historian documentary and to look at this list from around the world it made the top 10 for filmmakers all around the world like to see it on the list for people from iran azerbaijan all across africa it was so profound to see that internationally it was so much more recognized for everything that it is than it is here. So I'm really glad that you're introducing it to a whole nother generation of people to watch it. And we'll be watching it with you again tonight. Yay. <laughs> yeah, you'll see us, but not, yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad that you're doing this, thank you. And that's it for us. See you soon. <laughs> Bye, Margaret. Bye, thank you. All right, I think this concludes the program. Do you think so, Liz? I think it does. Yeah? I think, okay. yeah. Well, yeah. great. I will see you this evening as well. Thank you so much. And happy Resilience Week, everyone. Yes. Whoop, whoop. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>